everybody, this is Bhaskar, CIO for VMware, and I have my friends here, Didier, Jeremiah, Paul Green, Perez, uh, with me to have some interesting conversation about what we're doing uh, during the COVID uh, time, if you will. First, I you know, wish everybody well and hope everybody's safe, but why don't we let our guests make a quick introduction about themselves. So uh, can I start with you, Didier? Yeah, sure, Bas. Good morning. I'm, I'm Didier Sabadou. I'm working for Societe Generale, a European bank based in Paris, and I'm the deputy head of Digital Workplace. So I'm in charge of all the uh, laptop, desktop, telephony, messaging, communication, and all the stuff at the group level uh, across the world. Thank you. Jeremiah? Yeah, greetings everyone. I'm uh, Jeremiah Chunge from uh, Genghis Capital in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, ICT and alternative channels, basically looking at the internal infrastructure uh, of technology of the operations of the company, as well as the uh, external interface to the clients using the channels uh, that is technology. So from Genghis, can we go to uh, Angel? Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Paul Green with Angel MedFlight. I am the Chief Development Officer and CIO, uh, responsible for all of our information technology from a worldwide perspective since we operate all over the world as well as um, all of our business development and marketing um, and we operate pretty much all over the world um, as of right now we've operated in 52 countries nice to see you and then Fares? Uh, um kariki Fares, um ceo of node africa um we are a cloud we are a managed consulting company um so um jeremiah is one of our customers so we basically help companies figure out their cl cloud strategy Oh, nice. So thank you all for joining different time zones, different locations, but <clears throat> I thought we'll just have a quick, friendly discussion. And, uh, you know, first is, you know, are you all being safe? How's your companies doing? I mean, I, you know, are you, are your employees able to be productive? Give me a little bit about what the life is like that in your state, county, city, and your company, if you will. Yeah, I can, I can start if you want. So as we are based in, in, uh, in, in Europe, we have been, uh, I would say, the second wave. It started out, as, as you all know, this crisis started in Asia. Uh, so we have been hit uh, quite uh, early, early February, I mean, something like that, uh, and, and, uh, and quite uh, severely. Uh, so we had to adapt ourselves. The good news, if I may, <laughs> is that in, uh, as we are based in Paris, we have some uh, bad habits as French people, and uh, we had some strikes before, uh, in, uh, before some before Christmas, and we already had to adapt ourselves to uh, difficulty for people, for our staff to commute to the office. Uh, so we experimented in November, December with the strikes in the public transport, uh, which was uh, somehow facilitated uh, our, our task to, to adapt to the COVID crisis. Uh, and, and so we were quite fast in enabling a, a massive homeworking. Uh, so, yes, I would say somebody, there is, there is a, always a, a silver lining in each cloud, as you said. And Ferris, what is going on with you in, in, in your neck of the woods? Uh, in our side, we are, we are largely operating with a curfew, so movement has been limited. Um, we've been unable to leave the city for the last, um, I'd say, one and a half months. Um, movement into and out of the capital city and the second largest city, Mombasa, has been blocked. So it's, it's interesting. Um, Though the, the, the concern is that the cases are now really accelerating, regardless of the government's measures, even though they have been quite aggressive in trying to um, control um, the spread. So it's just, we suspect that the lockdown and the curfew will keep going for some time. So like right now, I can't leave my house. Um, you can't leave the house between, um, I think it's 7 p.m. and 5 a.m. Everyone has to be home in the capital, actually across the country. But in the capital city, you, you, you can't even leave the capital city at the moment. So there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment um, and not too much clarity on um, how this is, when, when this is going to end because things are looking, things are beginning to get worse. Earlier, we were having three new cases a day. I think today we reported over 100, so it's quite worrying. Yeah, because we, we thought it was relatively safe. We didn't hear much about um, you know, that, that region, right? Most of the times we heard uh, on other regions, but uh, that is not <clears throat> that is pretty sad to hear. Jeremiah, similar, or what is your what's your experience? Yeah, actually, uh, mine is similar since we are both in the same city, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, together with the Faris. 
And uh, it's, it's pretty much destabilized uh, businesses around and uh, uh, also expectations, you know, plans that uh, different businesses have put uh, in place. Um, ourselves, we were, we were on the verge of uh, launching a product that we had to do a sit and wait and just see uh, how the wave goes in the, in the, in the last one or two months. And uh, I mean, luckily we had done quite, quite much on uh, digital transformation, which has enabled us to uh, stay afloat and be able to serve our customers. But uh, it's not the case across the industry. I'm sure our peers uh, in the same industry have suffered quite a bit. So Paul, I mean, you are facing both ways. I mean, how are you dealing personally, your company and then, but you know, you're servicing you know, a lot of um, customers or your customers are also going through a lot of pain, not just with COVID, but with other issues, right? So it was unique. We, we knew once California got put on, you know, the stay at home order, we knew it was just going to be a matter of weeks for Arizona. So we wanted to take a really proactive approach. Um, we didn't want to be in a situation with our company where Arizona went on lockdown and we had to scramble to get everybody to work from home because what we do requires that we have operations 24 seven, 365. Um, so we instituted our um, business continuity plan about two weeks prior to um, the official Arizona lockdown. Um, we got everybody working from home in about three days. We were up and running full operations. Um, as that kind of started to progress, you know, we knew lockdown was coming and we wanted to make sure we were all, you know, fully operational. So once the operations kind of really went on lockdown, um, we were already operating and it started becoming increasingly harder for a lot of the, the facilities that we work with. You know, we work with hospitals all over. Um, they stopped allowing patients to come from the outside of the country. So now we can't go get patients, you know, which is what we do a lot in like Mexico and the Caribbean and things like that. That started to, you know, you guys can't go. So that's really hard for us because that's what we do. You know, we want to go pick up those patients. Um, then we had hospitals internally. We had a lot of meetings that are already pre-scheduled for us. We do a lot of work with a lot of facilities to help them out with their patients. Now you guys can't come you know, what does that look like? And then now some of the people that we work with are being furloughed because the technically, you know, a lot of the stuff that we work with is considered a elective procedure. And so things really started to rapidly change. Um, that's lasted pretty much through the last, you know, two months or so. Um, things have really started to open up over the last few weeks. Um, a lot of the facilities are starting to do electric procedures again. Things are really starting to pick up. Um, we're starting to move patients again. Um, there's a lot of urgency on certain types of patients because they have had to wait so long for their procedures. Um, things are really starting to change, you know, but there's so much strict, you know, policy now that has been put in place before these patients can move. Um, we are doing a couple of things proactively on our side to get some devices so that every patient can be checked a certain way. Blood gases can be checked a certain way, temperatures. We have all these internal protocols that we're working on. We have facilities that have their own protocols. We have a facility we're working with where they will only accept patients if they come via an air ambulance because they do not want them to have potentially be at risk by going commercially, all these different things. And so it's really completely changed the landscape of what you thought healthcare was because now you've got a scenario where it's no longer just healthcare. You can't just show up at a hospital and expect to be taken care of. There's so many precautions being taken care of. You've got people who are staying at home, and I don't know what the exact percentage is, but there's a huge rise in the number of heart attacks in the country because people are having cardiac issues, but they're too afraid to go to the hospital. You can't do that. You have to go because people have this idea that because of COVID, I'm not, I shouldn't go get my health care because, yeah. You know, but the reality is, is, you know what, it's better to go because the chances of you actually getting COVID are substantially less than you dying at home of your heart attack. So just go. I mean, there's a risk with everything, but I think that there is a much better reward for actually going out and making sure you get that health care that you need. So it's, it's been really, really unique. Um, we are still working from home, um, even though as of May 15th, um, Arizona has released their um, stay at home order. Um, we are still operating from home. We have no plans to go back to the office. We are working on our reentry plan. We've got a lot of different things in the works, but we have not set a date for the employees. Um, we do have a lot of things going on with the employees. You know, 
it's changed the landscape of how you operate. So like a lot of the parents, especially they got kids at home, they're working from home. They're not used to that. You know, you've got all these outside things, the anxiety of not knowing, you know, what's going to happen. It's really puts a lot of pressure, I think, on some of the employees. Um, we are going to announce something um, for the employees. So we're trying to do some proactive things to keep the employees spirits high, keep them positive, keep them going forward. You know, and just like everybody else that's on the call today, the only way we're going to get through this is as a team, you know, and every single person is trying to figure out how to do the best thing for their team. So we're putting into place some things just to keep our teams positive, just to keep them moving forward, just to keep their outlook, you know, bright, because the only way you get through something like this is as a team. I mean, there's not going to be one person who's going to say something that's going to change the way all of this works. You know, everybody's going to have to work together as a team to get through it. See, that's, that's kind of, Paul, that's a good one. That's kind of why I, we wanted to have this kind of a meeting together is there's so much information, misinformation, and things going on. I wanted to talk to real people, real practitioners, without an agenda to say, what are you going through? What can we actually do, et cetera? Um, here, you know, listen, I, 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 also it's good to start with that kind of perspective initially because you know, sometimes I start complaining. I'm taking my son's room. You know, things are all over the place. It's not a great place to work. Uh, it's not very professional, and, and I can complain about it. And then you look and say, hey, people are frontline people. There are people actually dying and getting really sick, and, and people don't have the internet and, and uh, the facilities to work. So people who are working remotely, like some of us can get away with it, you know, we should feel fortunate, right? I mean, so that's – sometimes we lose the perspective. We go into, well, everybody's working remotely, everybody's productive, everything's great. But uh, there is a lot more to life than just uh, being able to do that. So it's a good start. But, you know, talking about remote working, working from home and so on, you know, um, what are you folks doing specific? It's just amazing how efficiently the companies that can work remotely are working remotely for me. There's a lot of folks who just... So thank God we made the investment in the technologies uh, a few years back, and our business folks are now thanking us for saying, "Do it, thank you for doing the right things and going to the right technology." So uh, first is, are you doing something unique for the people? I mean, other than the actual enabling technologies, are you are you giving them some um, tools? Are you giving them a stipend or something to operate? Um, what are you folks doing to make it make people more flexible and more effective? Uh, what, so what we did is we granted them uh, the means to, to work from home. So through either first, the first things to do they were able to do is to access to their email and to their agenda and, and so to keep a uh, connection with, with their customers and, and with their staff. Uh, so it was on the mobile telephone, okay? Uh, that's something, nothing new here, but it was uh, just we hence hen increased the number of people who benefited from this uh, possibility. And, and then we created, uh, granted them a secured access to VPN and so to give them access to uh, the IS uh, by uh, massively increasing the number of uh, VPN connection. So we were before the crisis, uh, something in the range of 5,000 users, and now we are more in the range of uh, 50,000. So in a very few weeks, that's quite, quite, uh, quite impressive. Yes. One of the unique things for us that we didn't plan for, and I don't want this to sound like a VMware thing, but we were on Workspace ONE and Traditionally, before, if I wanted to help somebody out as a user with their computer, you know, you had to use remote desktop and you helped them out with remote desktop or you gave them a WebEx or nowadays people like to use Zoom, whatever it was. But there's actually this thing, item that's built into Workspace ONE, which allows you to support them and it, it takes over their computer and you can see it from your desktop. Um, it's changed everything. We, I couldn't believe how easy it was to help manage the users now, which is something we did not expect. So the, the, just the level of service for the individual employee, and like I always say I treat my employees like customers because mm -hmm. if you treat them you know, like a customer and you give them the best customer service, they're in turn gonna do that. It was so much better for them because it was so hard to assist them by using you know, remote desktop because they can't see what you're doing. But when they can see what you're doing and you can help them out, you, just simple things like with some of the users, they weren't used to connecting to the VPN. They weren't used to doing different things. And it's like, you know, once they got used to it, they're fine. But that was a real big help. I actually blown away by the way it works. And so like, that's been a really big positive thing. Um, 
Well, everything else is very standard. I mean, everybody's operating from home. Um, everybody is on a um, soft phone. Um, the beauty of it is, is no user at home works any differently than if they were in the office. And it was already pre-designed to work that way. And I know that's not the same for everybody, but you know, we built it to work the same regardless of where you're at. And that was just because of our business continuity, but it's some of the users absolutely love it. And some of the users are like, when can I go back to the office? You know, and I think that's normal. I mean, and I know you're like that too, Bass, because like I'm a people person. I want to go into the office and I, you know, I want to interact with people. And I, I think that, you know, for what I do, that's a, that's a huge positive thing for me. But I know that that's not the same thing for everybody. There's so many companies where working from home can be the new normal. Yeah, just a little twist on it. We'll come back to Jeremy and Ferris as well. Is, you know, this trend has gone several times. We never cared much about uh, call centers. That's why we outsourced it. We offshored it. We gave it to the lowest cost person possible in whatever locations. And then the service went so bad that people do judge you by the based on employee experience, right? So you can talk about digital transformation and doing all this stuff, if, but if people can get their email working or, or they need to be shown how VPN works, right? Once or twice. And there's nothing better than showing them, let me show you online. Exactly. And your volume of calls to help us comes down, right? People say, oh, that's it. I can do it next time, right? So, you know, in the YouTube kind of generation, you know, I, I've now learned how to fix my bicycle because I'm so bored sitting at home. I watch every video and I've taken every part of my cycle apart. But all you do is see somebody do it and say, that's not that complicated. I can change the railer. That's no big deal. So similarly, showing people how to do this is very effective. So what has happened for us in Help Desk is we said we first off, outsourced offshore, got the cost down and self-service, you know, made it kind of miserable for people. <laughs> And then realize that's the wrong way. And then we've come back and said, you know, genie, like genius bar, you know, you can come in and ask questions, you know, just talk to us. Don't need even log questions. People love that. Customer service came up. Due to COVID, we're not able to provide this desk site service anymore. So now we're doing that kind of service offline. And then people uh, get... Uh, so, but with, the, with an attitude of customer service rather than my cost being reduced, my satisfaction level is higher actually right now since I've gone offline again. So we've decided now, why should I bring it back? Why would I bring it back even if you open it? Because people seem to like it better. We do save money, but at the same time, that is not the only objective. The objective is employee experience first. So now we have taken all our colleague experience people. They're all working remotely, but they do the same thing like you do. Somebody calls, they do answer with a smile. You can call them on Zoom. You can chat. You can do on Slack. You can email them. You can go to the help desk and log. We're not going to yell at you if you don't log your calls. And, you know, we can either fix it for you or show you how we fix it. So I, I think that's, that is a, that's a big change in, in, in how we support people. So let me pause and say, uh, Faris and Jeremiah, you know, what are you, uh, something you guys doing to make it all work and enable flexibility? Well, in our case, a lot of the work has primarily been for our customers. Um, internally, we'd already deployed um, cloud native tools. So we were using Slack. We've got a Dropbox type um, solution for file sharing. Um, we have soft phones. So literally, it was just employees working from home. The workflow is exactly the same. Um, what we've ended up doing is there's, there's a lot more work we're doing for customers to enable them um, to have the same sort of experience. But for as internally, the process was quite seamless. Um, I don't think anyone had any form of issue. The only thing is people will maybe miss their desk phones and like, that's it. But, you know, you've got a soft phone client, you, you've got all the files that you need. Most of our applications are either SaaS apps or we host them and you can connect to them directly. So for us internally, the process was seamless. But we've been doing a lot more work with our customers to sort of help them get to the same level. So we've seen a lot more demand for people finally understanding that, wait a second, um, collaboration tools are important. <laughs> um, and yeah. For our side, actually, we, um, we were lucky to have done um, our digital transformation journey beginning 2017. And uh, in Kenya, that's, that was just about the time uh, we were getting into uh, our general elections, uh, which is held every five years. And uh, during that time, usually there's usually uh, unrest here and there, and uh, uh, so, so some people can't be able to travel to work or delay, and uh, we still have to serve our clients. So that's about the time we were 
uh, engaged with the North Africa, starting up our cloud journey. And uh, we had a rerun of elections even in the same year in 2017, uh, like two months uh, after we had uh, had the first election. And uh, it helped us prioritize uh, remote working from the, the word go, uh, because we, we wanted our clients to be able to be served by our staff uh, from the comfort of their home. And also we wanted the safety of our staff to be upheld. And uh, we saw a few learnings from that time and uh, we saw the need of what we needed to include uh, on, on, on our automation journey, uh, things like soft phones, which uh, Fires has talked about, um, adding it you know, onto, onto the platform, as well as uh, using more secure devices. So we got uh, uh, Chromebook laptops, which we uh, did uh, uh, VDIs, uh, virtual desktop interface, and uh, you know, virtualize uh, the applications that you are using. And uh, with that, clients, I mean, staff were able to uh, now progressively work even outside the office post-election, after, even after the election ended. They're able to work remotely outside the office and also be, were able to go to visit the clients and also demonstrate to them if it's a financial service or if it's an account or trade uh, live from, from uh, their, their machines. And uh, it, the deployment was easier. Uh, it, it's easy to manage. It's easy to monitor. Uh, it's easy to, to, to configure, you know, in minutes you're up and running for even if it's a new stuff that you're onboarding or if it's a stuff you're offboarding. Uh, so so, so those, those, those kind of prepared us um, uh, into, into what we are having now. And, uh, you know, the goodness of uh, digital transformation, it's, it, it's a journey. It's, it's not a project that ends. Uh, so, so you keep on improving and iterating as you go along. So once we completed that, we realized we have sorted out our staff needs in terms of being able to work internally and being efficient, but what about our clients? Mm -hmm. So we looked into developing a, a, a mobile app to be able to uh, give our clients an interface to the business, whereby they can be able themselves to, to, to transact, to uh, internally inside the app, you can also be able to talk to us. So you don't need to make a call to our office to be assisted. You don't need to write an email to be assisted. Uh, you, you go inside the app, you chat with us, you get feedback, you ask questions, you're answered. Uh, you view your portfolio on the app, you, you onboard it digitally, you don't need to come to the office physically to bring your forms. So that we did a year just after the, the elections had uh, been concluded. And uh, that was uh, 2018. So 2019, started working on another project now. And uh, come 2020, uh, 2020, after the pandemic uh, broke out, we, we, we realized the benefits uh, are huge on the investments that we had done coming along the journey up to now, because we saw a surge in uh, clients opting in, uh, to trying to use our platform using the mobile app. Uh, we saw a surge in clients trying to move from our competitors to us, because whenever they were calling our competitors, our competitors were telling them, uh, I'm not in the office, I can't access the systems, so I can't be able to serve you. But uh, uh, they, they were seeing online, we are talking about us being able to serve clients and they're now saying, how do I move my portfolio to you guys? How do I work with you guys? How do I open accounts with you guys? And also they were seeing uh, the interaction with the platform between us and the, and the clients uh, it is still seamless. So it enabled us to be able to, to, to carry our business and uh, staff had already familiarized because that's the other problem. You know, when the pandemic happens, uh, maybe you have it as a BCP plan, but staff have never familiarized with the, you know, with the tools, uh, and, and, and also being working uh, remotely. But staff on our side are already familiarized with it. So it was an easy transition to just continue doing uh, your work. Of course, we had already set up VPNs, they understood what VPNs are, they understood how to connect. So it was, it was an easier discussion. And then uh, what we also did uh, along, the, and along the way since we did our cloud journey, we also ensured that we did uh, cybersecurity um, implementation using an outsource partner. And we, we usually do quarterly trainings for sensitization to the staff because, you know, staff, your in-house threats can be your most uh, vulnerable point of entry. So they, un they understood, you know, the tricks that sometimes you're seeing now on the media. Uh, people are using uh, files that are sending as attachments uh, with, with attachments telling you 
you know, uh, fake numbers about an infection somewhere. And it's very enticing to look at that file or click and open, but you don't know the source or the, the email. So they, 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 are, they are more sensitized about how to even uh, look out for phishing attacks. And uh, we've done simulations, we've done uh, uh, even, even, even testing of, the client, of our staff without telling them. And then we do another uh, training and say, actually, this was a test and these are the answer passed and these are the answer failed. And this is how do you prevent yourself. So the preparation up to the, the, the point of uh, COVID enables us to, to just seamlessly, seamlessly, continue, seamlessly continue. And uh, most of the staff were able to just transition and be able to uh, continue working and uh, clients were able to still continue being served. Yeah. So, Didi, I have a question. I mean, are we going to go back? Um, why would we go back? And so I, 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 I agree with Paul saying I'm dying to go to work. I want to see people. I want to, uh, you know, I don't want to be working like this. But putting that aside, why would we want to be in a hurry to bring people back? And, you know, you know, what is it? We figured out how to work. There's some benefits. In, there's a lot of work, benefits in working remotely. Uh, I feel like I could... Uh, hire anybody I want right now, instead of just waiting for people who move to California. And I can hire a diverse set of folks. Uh, so, so I think it does a lot for inclusion, diversity, obviously pollution. It looks so much cleaner. I've never seen my city this clean ever. And I am incredibly productive. In fact, the reason I'm tired is not because I'm not able to work, but because I'm able to work all the time. So I have to figure out how to take a break. I don't take a coffee break or things that I, you do at work. So. What is the feeling in Europe, though? I mean, sometimes the regulation and so on would get a uh, little tedious uh, in some cities and countries. But are, are we going back? Are we going to go five days a week to work? Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I fully agree with what Jeremy just uh, shared with us and, and, and to your point. And, and that's true that when, I mean, uh, when we are well prepared, when we I believe companies will uh, engage the digital transformation uh, a long time ago, they are well prepared. And, and they... Um, were able to cope with this crisis uh, almost seamlessly. But uh, I would say between uh, managing a crisis mode and the day-to-day, -day, the real life, there might be a, a difference. And what is sustainable for a few weeks or even a few months might not be sustainable in the long run, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, because we are, and maybe we're not ready, so we are learning uh, while walking and we are discovering uh, how to, to overcome any new hurdles each time we are facing one, that's true. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid there are some uh, limitations we are facing at the moment. Uh, we'll take an example. We are to, to um, some of our, uh, so first we have some part of the bank. People are actually still uh, in the office. They have no choice because we have some in the branches, in the retail branches. It's not the same story. And our colleagues, they have to, to, to go there every Every day, uh, so we have to equip them with a mask, gloves, uh, alcoholic gel, and stuff to, to make sure they have safe conditions. So, I'm talking about the other part of the bank, which is more the investment bank or, or the support functions. Well, are not directly client-facing. Uh, so that's true for those one. We have been able to to deliver almost, uh, not almost. We're actually all the services, uh, all client, uh, all activities. Uh, we have been able to to deliver them uh, without any significant impact which is, uh, again, quite um, uh, unbelievable when you think about it. Uh, but uh, we have some of our staff, they are at home, they don't have uh, fiber, they don't have uh, broadband, or, and they have kids, uh, they won't be able, or the kids were not uh, allowed to go to school as well. They are uh, wives or the family member were uh, working from home, so they had to share uh, infrastructure. And we noticed a broadband issue, I mean, uh, bandwidth issue, which was okay, we managed to adapt, but when we had to, to patch, because we have some security patch, for instance, we have to download the inch PC and make sure, uh, well, it was quite an issue for some of them to, to, to patch every month, uh, I don't know, 50,000 uh, PC every month uh, to distribute in the bandwidth and make sure people are still able to have a video call and, and, and everything, it, it was an issue. So. It was okay for a few days, few weeks, maybe a few months, but maybe not. we are not ready yet for the full, uh, to consider it as a new normal. Uh, 
that's the first uh, topic. And the second one, you said you are totally able to onboard new resources and, uh, and, and stuff like that. For us, it's not yet the case. Uh, we have some, uh, because we still have uh, two factors of authentication. We have some stuff like that. We have to access to your information systems. And, and uh, we have to, to, to give somebody a uh, uh, access card to give him a, a, a new uh, corporate laptop or corporate phone. And uh, so far, there are still some uh, physical contact. Uh, so we try to limit them as much as possible, uh, but we are not yet uh, totally ready for zero contact. So Didier, we are more than happy to share. We're, not, we're doing onboarding, everything, two-factor authentication, issuing laptops, everything. I'm sure Paul is doing it all remotely now. And there are two or three ways, solutions to make it happen, including one VMI mix, but there are plenty of solutions. So we're more than happy to share that with you, right? So I think, I think that has actually been brilliant <laughs> because I expected, I get tweets from employees who join saying, I joined this company and the laptop magically arrived at home and I clicked a few keys and was just like setting up a mobile phone. I was ready to go to factory email. And people don't expect that, right? They don't ex they expect the first week to be miserable. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. You agree? People expect the old fashioned way. <laughs> it's, it's a new world. Yeah. So, I mean, even three years ago, you guys, yeah. it, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking to, it's almost like a 180 degree shift from what you're used to. And that's, that's hard because especially if you've been like me, I've been in the industry now, this is going on my 22nd year. If you had told me when I started that that was going to happen, I'd be like, you're crazy because it's so hard. I was like, do you know how long it takes me to set up a laptop? And when I first started, you'd spend like 12 hours setting up a laptop. Now it's like 15 minutes. Those are some of the good ones that are happening. I think this has definitely changed. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to go to work five days a week. I may go to work several times, but I'm just thinking through is why would I, I may work six days a week because there's so much you can do from home, but would I go five days a week uh, to work? Uh, you know, it's because that I think I will go to work more or less to just show people I'm working. Um, so what I can get done in five days, I can get done in four days easily if I'm going to work, I think. So, and things like that. Some people can do it one day a week, but you know, what we go to work for now, I'm realizing is to build a social group, right? So it's a lot easier to work if you've met with people face to face. And that's what I miss with the colleagues is I want to reconnect, not every hour on the hour, but I want to reconnect with them frequently. So we reestablish those relationships. Yeah. And, and for me, that's exactly the point is what we are missing uh, when you are on, on board it. Okay, I can imagine the technology and probably the one provided by VMware could allow us to, to remove all those uh, need for physical contacts for when we onboard, onboard new joiners. But then to give this feeling to be part of the team, to, to, to create this team spirit, uh, of course, we have, the, we have Zoom, we have uh, many new tools. I, mean, I don't know how many of them are uh, on the market, but there are plenty of them, very efficient. And, and, but, but still, uh, you can, when you know someone, you can talk to them, you can see them, you can have a, but the ability to, to create uh, the feeling to be part of a team. Uh, you need a bit of... Uh, of physical and um, people gathering to, together, and uh, um, for me that would be the, the probably the biggest uh, uh, things preventing us to to call that a real new normal. Yeah, I agree. And I used to at work, I used to get Nairobi coffee. Now I get some stupid coffee at home, <laughs> and I have to make it myself, so it doesn't taste the same. So that's I probably I want to go, and I can't complain about any of this because either I make it or if I complain to my boss here. I would get nothing, so, uh, so I'm, I have to be happy with what I what I get, right? So uh, uh, the 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 thing is, let's. This looks like a long haul for us, you know. I mean, and Paul, maybe you would have it uh, since you spend more time with the, the medical folks. Is initially I said, hey, another two weeks we're going to open, another month we're going to open, we're going to be fine, we're we're going to get herd immunity, or we're going to have great medicines that's coming up, and while the medical community go, is going as fast as you can. They can. It still looks like it could take you know, a year to get uh, a proper vaccination. It could take us 18 months after that to, for all of us to get vaccinated. So you're talking either a year and a half to two years before we can all start hugging each other and, and celebrating. So clearly we have to work on a work 2.0 kind of thing. Um, to me, it seems like for, for a longer time than before. Would you agree? Is that how you see it? You know, the last estimate I saw was two years before they can either 
have a vaccination and or get everybody vaccinated. So two years is a long time. Um, I think that I would be very okay with, say, my revenue cycle team working from home because they don't need a lot of collaboration. They don't need a lot of human interaction to be really good at their jobs. And so I think that that work 2.0 for them, that's, that's not that far of a stretch. But then you look at like my flight coordination team who they intake the calls, they're doing okay. But when you can look at somebody that sits next to you and say, Hey, I've got this patient, this is the scenario, you know, and then you start talking about the logistics of it. You start talking about the patient condition. You're going to start making decisions that are better because you can immediately talk to somebody. And those decisions are going to be better for both the, you know, the patient's outcome and their, their safety as well as like insurance and cost. And, you know, there's all these things that you roll up into it that, you know, a lot of people don't really realize what has to happen. So that's, that's going to be unique. Um, I I, I can see your points. I think you clearly on this side. So I'm going to ask Ferris a slightly different question is uh, Mm -hmm. you do have to bring some people to work, right? I mean, it's like some people actually do want to work as well. And also you're required like uh, Didier and Paula said, some, some people need to come to work. How do you actually thinking about bringing people to work so I'm, I, I, you know so you cannot overcrowd them you cannot have all of them come at the same time you know how do you ensure that people are not coming you know close to each other uh, are you guys using any tools or how are you thinking about bringing people back to work well at the moment we have no plans of bringing people back to work um, but should we do that um, we were lucky enough that our office has quite an amount of space um, and so that was not quite a problem. Um, initially, um, there are just a few things, the, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll just go on a very slight tangent. If you look at the technology that's had the biggest impact um, with humanity, it's always been collaboration, whether it's the printing press or even the internet. Like, we are naturally cooperative beings. Um, but the thing is, when you're communicating with someone, there's so many cues that you sort of miss when you're like online here. Um, I if we were in a room together, I'd be able to read everyone's facial cues properly, but no, there's just a tiny screen and there's a lot of communication that we really just can't, um, there's a lot that's unsaid that we can't communicate. Um, you know, a cringe when somebody says something you disagree with or that sort of thing. Um, and so I think to answer your question in a roundabout sort of way, the need for an office has always been, there. if you look, I'll use VMware as an example. Um, you've got over 20,000 employees scattered across the world. It's not like all of you had to show up at in Palo Alto. You already had the tools to collaborate and like the teams working in Africa and the teams working in Asia in different time zones and all of them could collaborate to build one company. So that was already the case. But the reason why people had an office is because there's more to it than just sort of exchanging emails and, um, and all of that. So the first priority is keeping people safe. Um, the way we look at it is we're in an uncertain period. Um, we don't know when this ends. Like, like you said, like, um, there's, there's a Warren Buffett quote that the forecast usually tells more about the forecaster than the forecast itself. Um, because we really don't know what the future holds. If at the beginning of 2020, all of us had grand plans, yet here we are. And so our take is that we'll just respond um, to the needs as they are. So for certain things like there are certain documents people have to ship around physically. Those people have to come to work. You can schedule it. You can see, you know, like if a document has to be signed by three people, first person can come and sign it and the second person can go. Um, you can create more space in the office by having some people work from home and, you know, you just schedule it um, so that everyone is safe. But the way, the, the approach we're taking is just, um, it's better to be safe than sorry. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to have somebody's death of my children. There are other considerations as well for us because not everyone drives. Um, so if you ask people to come back to work, um, they're going to be using public transport. Like globally, public transport has been one of the primary ways people get the sickness. And so all these considerations mean that we are on the side of safety because the reality of the matter is we just don't have enough information um, on, on what's so if you, you have some data, like, you know, it's relatively safe to work if you're two of you in an office, but um, we are just taking, the, we, we're taking a very cautious approach. So I think, uh, so I think uh, Paul, you may appreciate this. So one of the things we have done is 
We've seen in certain places where collaboration has gone even higher. I asked for, for my Workspace ONE team, since you're a Workspace ONE team, I told them, I don't know how to bring back people to work because I have to make sure that the building is only 50% occupied or 40% or occupied. And I can't be standing guards counting how many people come in and how many people go in, read a badge, whatever. And, and then secondly, I want to tell people you're coming close to each other, close to six feet, you know, uh, 10 times yesterday, right? Just to give a warning. And then you should do that without violating privacy and other kind of things, right? So one of the things we've asked, we, we spitballed with a bunch of engineers and they've done it in a relatively short time is, with Workspace ONE, they're, they're releasing a product. I think we're going to call it Campus. It's so new that I'm the customer number one. So you folks can be the customer number two, three, if you want. It is like uh, you can use that phone to enter the building if you want. So you, you don't have to put your badge and touch uh, any of those readers. It'll open like Star Trek doors. The doors will open. That's one idea. When you come inside and then... Uh, we know how many people are there, and we have beacons that we have put on the campus in several places. So, you know, um, we can tell you that you came close to um, somebody else eight times. It doesn't mean you're infected. We're just saying you're not, you're not really following protocol. And eight or nine times yesterday, and it's it's anonymous. So I don't. I'm, it's just the system telling you. But Paul, you came within uh, within uh, people ten times yesterday. Just watch it. And if you say, "Where did I do this?" It'll say restroom, break area, places you would not think, right? So uh, that's one. The second is uh, if you're at home and you have to drive three hours, and then you find out the building is already fifty percent occupied. That's really frustrating. A, you didn't want to come to work, and then when you come to work, you're not allowed to get in because it's occupied. So you can check all that and say it's thirty percent occupied, twenty percent occupied. When you get to forty percent, we can just tell you don't even bother driving. Right, it, you know, uh, and then you can book offices like you would do, perhaps for like an airline. You know, give me an IC, give me a, this, uh, give me a, give me a place in this place, and you can book those rooms, etc. Uh, and then in cases where you know, somebody actually declares, self declares, and says, "I have been infected with anything, not just COVID." We don't need to know the names of the people. In fact, if I come back and say I'm infected, uh, we're we're thinking well, we can say. Uh, you know, all the beacons I walk to, all the places I walk to, now those becomes infected, right? So now if you if you walk, Jeremiah, close to a beacon that I have been in, in infected, it'll just tell you you came to an infected beacon. It's not going to tell you Baskire is infected, there's no privacy. It's just going to say you came near, near an infected beacon. The beacon is infected. So you may want to get yourself checked. I'm not tracking it, you know, none of that. So we're looking at all that. Two, two reasons I mentioned that is there are some things where you can push collaboration very hard online because we did all of this online. But the reason we were able to push that online is I have a good relationship with Shankar, his team, all the guys who do development and so on. So I have enough glue built already with them that I know them. If I didn't know any of them, then it would have been a little bit more difficult to, you said, who the hell are you? Why are you telling me you're not my, my business unit leader? You know, you know, we don't, that's not a priority. You'll get into all those kind of discussions. So that's one reason is there's ways to build this collaboration. If you if you constantly work on the relationship, you know, even when you go off this, you know, have some celebration with people, then you can continue doing it remote, remotely. And secondly, you know, you guys, if, if that's how I was thinking about, can I use technologies to bring people back to work? And so if you guys want to be, uh, try it out or contribute to it, you're more than welcome uh, as well, if you're, especially if you're a VMware customer. So, uh, so let me open to Paul, any, any thoughts on how you're going to bring back? folks? We've been thinking about it. Um, we've got a whole letter that we kind of developed. Um, you know, what are our steps to bring them back? What are the phases that we want to bring, you know, our employees back? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that happen within the office that, so like right now, every two days, we have three people that actually physically go to the office because we have to do insurance claims. And those insurance claims have to be printed. They have to be binded. They have to be put in an envelope. They have to be mailed out. We then have um, appeals for insurance claims. Again, have to be printed. So there's interaction that these people are going to be relatively close proximity to each other. And so how do we figure that out? Um, right now, it's no big deal because it's the same three people. They know exactly what to expect. They each have their own printer uh, because there's three print, three big printers in the office and they're able to each use their own individual printer. Works great, but what happens when you bring everybody else back? And 
So like right now, they're doing the printing for every employee. Getting everybody to work from home is one thing. Bringing everybody back, getting their computer set back up in the office and making sure they're comfortable in their workspace, making sure that there's six feet between employees. That's not going to happen instantaneously. So you can't be like, everybody has to be here Monday morning at 8 a.m. and I expect you to be working by 8.15. There's going to be a few hours where everybody has to get comfortable and stuff like that. So that, that'll have to be phased in. And when you phase that in, how do you phase it in? And do you, do you run, you know, shifts where like half the staff comes in at one time and half the staff comes in at the other. And it's tough because at the same time, we had the whole conversation about, do we bring everybody back? Is it even worth it? Because we have this group of employees that theoretically could work from home. But then when you start looking at that, it's like, I'm still paying for the building for another five years on my lease. And so it's like, am I, do I not want to use it anymore? I mean, there's, there's been so many variables that it's been an interesting challenge. It's fun. I'll tell you that. Like I've never, the pandemic has, you know, put people in positions to do things that they've never done. Just like what you guys are doing right now with the, the access and the beacons and stuff like that. So I think we have a uh, couple of minutes or so. So let me um, first thank all of you uh, for a um, tremendous kind of discussion. I hope it was useful. And it was the purpose of this was to make sure practitioners get uh, value out of it. Um, I think leadership clearly shows all of you, none of you talked about, I mean, very few discussion on IT. It's about how do you bring people back to work? How do you get the company going? It's very, very clear that uh, IT and all of you have stepped up from a leadership standpoint to make it all happen. Right? And I think they say crisis brings the best out of leadership. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, my only hidden agenda is uh, you know, um, IT and the information technology professionals are typically typecast into somebody who are geeky, technical, work the things, and so on, right? And and I think that the whole world should see this as, as a lot of the frontline workers are people such as yourself who are enabling enormous productivity. Otherwise, we will be dead in water in, in most companies, right? So I want to thank you on behalf of the you know, community. And we'll do more discussions. Give me feedback if you like these kind of discussions. Uh, I'd like to see you folks again and have another chat. We could have probably talked for hours on this. <laughs> so, Didier, uh, Didier, thank you. And Jeremiah, Paul, Faris, thank you. Thank you very much for meeting Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye. -bye. Bye.